Meeting the order for November the 10th. First thing is the approval of the agenda. Move to approve. Second. Okay, we've got a motion by Grant, second by Kevin to approve the agenda. We'll do a roll call. Commissioner Whalen. Aye. Commissioner Campbell. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Mojo. Aye. Commissioner Haney. Aye. Commissioner Gross. Aye. For that, we'll move on to the minutes for October 27th, which I have in front of you. Need approval for them. <laughs> Timing is good. I'll make a motion to approve. Get a motion by Grant to approve the 20, October 27th meeting. Second. And we got a second by Kevin. Uh, any discussion? Roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Whalen. Aye. Mr. Campbell. Mr. Mojo. Aye. Commissioner Haney? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Gross? Aye. And we'll move on to the bill, same thing. Move them approved. Move. Second. Uh, motion by Kevin, second by Grant to approve the bills and vouchers. Any discussion? Roll call. Uh, Commissioner Whalen? Aye. Commissioner Campbell? Aye. Commissioner Mojo? Aye. Mr. Haney? Aye. Mr. Gross? Aye. And with that, we'll move into our weekly update report from our public health director, Kathy McKay, and uh, Jamie's with her today. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Hopefully, um, the two commissioners that are remote have received the scan copies of our numbers. Um, Okay, so it, uh, you can see from the first page, you know, our positive cases uh, continue to increase. We're at 3,233. Um, our 14-day case rate for 10,000 people, and you know, that's at 105.57, so that has increased as well. The number of positive cases in Minnesota continues to climb, almost 185,000, <clears> and uh, the cumulative positive rate for Minnesota is 5.7. So you can see as we look at the grid where there's confirmed cases, um, no longer needing isolation and active cases, we're at 655 active cases right now for no as of November 4th. Our age categories, um, when you look at the ages in Clay County cases, the highest age ranges um, currently is that 18 to 22, and we're also seeing um, pretty significant um, numbers in the ages 30 to 39. So those are our two high points for the age ages um, for Clay County cases. And then on the back page of the stapled one, we're seeing the Cass County numbers that we've reported uh, the last couple weeks. So they're at, they're at almost 12,000 cases. Um, 1,542 active cases. Their cumulative positivity rate is 16.99, so that's pretty significant. Their 14-day case rate per 10,000 is also quite high at 123.9 um, from uh, up through October 26th, and then the number through um, 26th through the 8th of November is 165.88, so their positivity rate continues to climb, and they, um, are certainly one of the highest uh, states with those um, rates and the positivity rate. Um, and you have all received the letter from Commissioner Malcolm, <clears throat> and they sent this out to about 42 counties that are over that 5%. We expected um, our rates would increase. I've talked about it at numerous um, numerous meetings that we are going to see increases. You know, we have this, the saliva testing site, so we're doing a lot more testing. Um, so that uh, contributes to the increase in our um, positivity uh, rates, of course, because we're seeing a, a percentage of, of increases in the, as the more we test, the more we see. Um, the overall positivity rate for Minnesota is 5.7. Now the Clay County number, as we don't often talk about, um, the latest number was 
Um, let's see, our latest number is 7.4. And I've described this before, where we do not receive all of the negative tests from the North Dakota Public Health Lab. So it isn't exactly accurate. It's, it's around that rate. But without those negative tests, we're not really seeing uh, an accurate positivity rate. Um, that's just the reality of, of being on the border. Um, in Clay County, so what they capture um, across the state is, is just the positivity rate based on the test, um, lab tests they have. So it's been, in Clay County, it's been in the sixes, like 6.2, 6.5 this last month. Um, and now we've increased a little bit to that 7.4. 7 um, 7 so we're, again, in a group of many counties across the state of Minnesota, as well as the state overall being um, higher than 5%. Um, the state has been around in that 5.3, 5, 5.7% 5 5 positivity rate. Personally, I think we're probably even higher than that. I mean, all over the state, because Correct. I'm just talking about my family situation right now this past couple of weeks. I mean, if you don't know you have it, I mean, my son tested positive. But he had no symptoms at all. So there's all kinds of people out there, I think, that have this. If you don't get tested, you don't get counted. Correct. But because he tested, he gets counted. I mean, and I think there's a lot of people, they don't have no symptoms, but they are. They do test positive. That's and correct. I think so we're even higher than these figures. It's out there, and it's, I think it's, it's spreading. We've it, got to be careful. Masks on. You're... you're absolutely right on it it's out there it's spreading it will continue to spread and you're also right on about numbers of you know there's so many asymptomatic people or very mild symptoms that um, it's just not even enough to go get tested sometimes so um, you know some people have minimum symptoms some people have a little bit more it's such a variance um, the younger um, group of um, people have less symptoms or less severe symptoms so um, you know, we worry about the, the ones with the um, more chronic health conditions, those that are more predisposed to having adverse effects from this, as well as the elderly. Um, so, you know, they're the, they, they don't have quite the immune system to fight it off. So it's a concern. So I'll let Jamie talk a little bit about our, some of our testing and other things. Okay, well, I'll start with the uh, saliva testing. Um, this last week, the week of November 1st, there were 3,433 people that went through the saliva testing site. And um, it's pretty much an even split between Minnesota and North Dakota. So we are continuing to serve North Dakota residents as well. Of those, 22.18% were positive. And so we're continuing to see an average of 20% of the people coming through that testing site are positive, which is high, you know. Yes. And so that means we are, we are catching the positive, so we're able to respond um, and get them to isolate and contact their, their um, reach out to their contacts for quarantine as well. Um, and so that was about a thousand more than we tested the week before. So we're increasing the number of people testing by about a thousand. Initially, when they started, they told us that they had the capacity to um, test 800 to a thousand individuals a day. So that's they've got plenty of opportunity for testing. And um, the comments that we're hearing about testing is that it's going really well, um, that people can register online. Um, we've had people that if they don't have a computer and they can't do that, they can walk in. It sounds like they're doing a great job of serving walk-ins and appointments um, fairly, so people aren't standing in that line waiting to, um, to get in if they've not already scheduled an appointment. So um, it continues to go well, and we've heard a lot of positive feedback from the community and having that as a resource. Are you going to say something? No. no? Yeah. Okay. And then I'm just going to highlight a few things that were discussed yesterday. Um, the Commissioner of Health, um, Jan Malcolm, and the Governor um, had a press conference as they do you know, every week and a, a lot of comments came out of that but basically um, if you haven't heard the Governor's talking about an announcement this afternoon there's a lot of um, discussion about what that will involve but basically the, the Governor was saying that we have um, 
Minnesota Department of Health is seeing three infection sources, social events such as weddings, funerals, and large family gatherings, and bars and restaurants. And so, again, keep stressing the fact that it's social gatherings uh, where people feel safer um, with their own family and friends so they're not wearing masks, and those are the areas where we're seeing the spread, which is spilling over into our workplaces and our schools and our um, universities and long-term care. So some of the governor's comments were that um, the top five sta states for spreading the infection included North Dakota, our neighbor, and Minnesota is estimated to move into the top 10 very soon if we don't uh, make some changes in Minnesota. Active cases in Minnesota have tripled over the last couple of weeks, and the average daily positivity rate is poised to hit an all-time high by the end of the week, averaging 15% daily positive rate for November 11th. Um, if we don't make some massive changes quickly, we will see uh, higher cases and, and deaths. Um, C Commissioner Malcolm talked a little bit about that silent asymptomatic spread. Um, and it, it's unusual when it comes to viruses. Usually we know when someone has a cold and we can kind of keep our distance from them. Um, but in this case, the, the asymptomatic spread is what's causing a lot of challenge for us with COVID. Um, they kind of talked about the silent spreaders being the 18 to 35-year-olds, um, and they really want to focus hard on getting those that are the silent spreaders, the asymptomatic positives, to be tested so that we know they're positive and we can respond to that quickly in order to isolate and quarantine to, to be able to control the spread. Um, you know, we've heard about super spreaders, and she said transmission is not just a cup, from a couple super spreaders. It's from thousands of mini events. Again, really stressing the fact that it is those small gatherings of family and friends is where we're seeing that spread. Um, and then the governor also talked about um, vaccine distribution and the plan coming for vaccine di distribution as being a massive in undertaking. Um, I mentioned before, there's a lot of work from the federal, the state, and the local level um, to prepare for vaccine administration. And um, just, it's, it's coming soon, and we're hoping that we will start to vaccinate healthcare individuals and the most vulnerable populations in our communities. So, so those were the highlights from yesterday's press from conference. What? From what, just from a personal experience, what I went through with the testing, you know, I think I would have liked some sort of sheet or told me what to do. I mean, because when you get tested until you get your results, I mean, you really don't know what to do. You know, you, I mean, are you quarantined? Aren't you? You don't know whether you have it or not. So there's some sort of precautions that we should be taking, I think, you know, if we're not quite sure or something, you know, because it took us almost a week to hear from our provider, you know, and stuff before they finally, we said, okay, you tested positive, <coughs> you contacted your provider, they returned your call. I mean, it was almost a week later, you know, so had we not taken precautions, we could have made a lot of contact. And I don't know whether we should be given a sheet out saying, you know, do this until you hear from your results, do this, you know, uh, stay quarantined <coughs> or something like that. I don't know if they, you know, it just seemed like they were, we were just left out of limbo for, for right. Me. I know Vault, um, when they came and set up, they said they were very, um, they wanted to be paper free so that they would not have that. And I know I personally tested as well at that site and I went through things kind of quickly because of what I know. Um, so I'm not sure how much information was in there in terms of the directions, if it told me what to do until I got my results. But I do want to tell you that um, people call us all the time all day long and that's what we help them with Good. um like the dgf school district actually literally has our phone number and our names on their website and the information that goes out um, but also our universities and our our k-12 school systems are doing a lot of that themselves and i can't stress that enough um, they are they are doing all of the case investigations in-house we get phone calls from them regularly what do you think about this as well but a lot of it is being done at the business level. I had a, a business owner who called to say, okay, this is what I'm doing. So they will often run by us. This is what I think I need to do. Is this correct? 
Um, and so we just really want to encourage people, if you've been tested, stay home. If you're not sure exactly what it means beyond that, to call us because we're happy to answer those questions. Yeah, okay, good. I'm glad to hear that because, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, it's serious. Mm -hmm. it, it, and it's getting worse. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, it's just, go ahead. Yeah, one of the, um, the catch-22s in this thing is that there's a lot of people who, um, you know, as you just mentioned, when you're when you go to get tested, <laughs> then you're you're basically quarantining at the same time. So there's a lot of people who don't think they're <laughs> have COVID, and they don't want to go get tested mm -hmm. because they'll be quarantined and not be able to work. Right. Yes. And it's a real dilemma, and uh, I don't know how we can figure that out. But um, and it goes to what. What Frank said, he, you know, you don't, you might not know you have it, and you go and you mm -hmm. find out you do. But then, uh, as you also said, we had, I think, based on your number, we probably had 1,700 people tested last week, yeah. in, in more here of, of Clay County okay. residents, okay. and of those 1,700, if the 20 percent are right, that'd be 350 people end up being positive. Um, but that also means that there was 1,300 and some that weren't. Mm -hmm. And those 1,300 and some still end up being quarantined. And so you can see the, the, the problem that creates from, <coughs> from those who depend on paychecks from week to week. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know how we fix this. I, right. I, I just don't know how we fix it. And, and you're right about that challenge. That's, mm -hmm. that's hard because people don't want to and have a hardship if they have to quarantine. So yeah. we know that there's people out there that aren't gonna get tested, or if they do, may not say anything and go to work or school. Um, so so, that so, of those, so, if I, so of those 1,300 that, that did not test positive, are they immediately released from quarantine then, or do they still have to stay on that 10-day quarantine? The exception to that would be if they just decided they wanted to see if they were an asymptomatic spreader, so they had no known contact no, and no, no symptoms. Okay, then, then they would be released. Yes. Correct. And they're told that then? Um, well, we, we tell them that. I'm not sure if no, the... That's, if that's the, where I thought what the problem yeah. was. You didn't get that information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a gap. Then. I mean, we just we went through the tests. We left goodbye. You know, and mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm not glad they're testing. That's right. good. It just felt <laughs> like we were left in limbo. Okay, now what do we do? We got tested. Now we we don't know our results. Do we have it? Do we don't have it? Are we quarantined? Uh, or are we? You know, it just it just seemed like there was something missing there. You know, mm -hmm. and it just. Uh, like I say, even after we heard we were positive, we still waited a couple more days to hear from our providers oh, okay. for them to return. I mean, that's got nothing to do with the testing, but uh, that has to do with the providers. But uh, it's it's so easy to spread it. I mean, it's just if you're not careful, right? And that's why I'm just saying you, we just got to all we consider ourselves that we we have it. Mm -hmm. Be careful. We do have the information. Um, you know, we put it out on on Facebook, we also put it out on our website, so you know that some people are receiving it that way. I did want to say we, Jamie mentioned, you know, K-12 and higher ed and, and the great job they're doing. We are working with both of all, all of the superintendents in K-12, um, making some hard decisions about, you know, the school um, and what they're going to be doing, um, as well as higher ed. Now, higher ed has made some decisions about when they're going to go remote and, and the break that they're going to have um, f between the holidays, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, so they're making some really tough decisions now about um, you know having to have a, a longer time period where the students won't be in house um, and they'll be doing their classroom remote. As we see the numbers go up, they're just, it's, it's time to make some some of those tougher decisions, so. And personally, I think you people are putting a lot of stuff out there, and that's good. It's just that we're not reading it sometimes, you know. It's there, but we're not, oh, we're I not agree. reading. There's a lot of information, and that's, yeah. that's very true. So I'm not trying to put the blame on anybody. No. Nope, we totally understand. It's my responsibility understand. to find out about it, too. Mm -hmm. So don't just sit back and say, well, no one told me about it. You know? Yeah. Boy, we haven't heard about it by now. 
wake yeah. up people. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Any other questions for? Okay. Thank okay. you very much thank for the you. update and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Okay, with that, we'll go into our county administrator, Steve, and our human resource director, Darren, for an update on CARES. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Uh, we are uh, continuing to wind down here towards uh, towards December 1st. We're continuing to, uh, to meet uh, as a CARES committee, uh, and uh, we've uh, had to have had some additional items on the, the agenda today. Well, we will here as we as we wrap up towards the end. Uh, we also provide you this past week. Uh, we made some adjustments to our chart, and, and uh, I'll turn it over to Darren here to to uh, further discuss that. Okay, thank you. Um, for this week, I think last week we covered the going to the seven categories, and so that's what this chart reflects in front of you. Um, the only two things that we were adding this week, and, and they'll both be on the agenda after this, and they are included in the chart, is the HR tech program and uh, the DMV furniture request. The, the tech program is 4,900 and the uh, DMV furniture request is uh, 5,426. So that is um, reflected in the chart that you have here. Um, after what we have uh, after today, if it, if it is approved, we'll have about $75,000 left. But there are still a few things that we will need to purchase um, prior to the deadline of getting all the funds spent. Um, and those will be brought to you probably next week or the week after um, so that uh, you'll have a good, probably by the next two weeks, you'll have a very good idea of how much has been spent uh, of the CARES funding, which totaled seven million eight hundred forty-three thousand four hundred and forty-three dollars um, The phase one and phase two have all been done. Checks, I believe, have been sent out for the small business loans. And um, so that's pretty much what I have as far as the, the charts and the, and the CARES funding goes of what's been spent. Thanks, Darren. Just to kind of touch a little farther on, on the business relief part, portion, between our two programs that dealt with one to 50 uh, people employed, our 501c3s and 19s, and our long-term care and group homes, uh, through the CARES funding, we provided uh, $1,586,000 in funding uh, total. And so that's a, that's a very exciting, exciting piece. To, not that we have to do that, but that we're able to get that out and help, uh, help our local businesses. Uh, just wanted to provide a quick update. Uh, our, there is a press release, press release that's gone out uh, about our DMV. Uh, we will be closing uh, today at 1:30 uh, to uh, to uh, begin the transition to the to the Morehead Center Mall uh, location. Uh, the state is also transitioning their Min Lars to Min Drive on Thursday and Friday, and so locations across the state are being shut down. Uh, and so we our our location will be shut today. Uh, from 1.30 uh, and we'll be reopening at the Morehead Center Mall location uh, at 8 a.m. on the 16th. Uh, so just so our, our citizens aware, are aware, if you've made appointments uh, for, for next week, we would want you to report uh, to the Morehead Center Mall. Uh, and, and not necessarily CARES related, but I just wanted to provide a, a, a brief update from CARES from our perspective is one of the things that our committee uh, did in evaluating where our dollars would be best spent was looking looking across in our communities uh, of what funding was available either through CARES programs and, and through through the grants. And a, a number of weeks ago, Lori Schwartz, uh, Executive Director of Lakes and Prairies Community Action Partnership, along with Emma Schmidt, came before this board uh, to talk about a grant uh, that they were applying for, a uh, housing assistance program uh, through the state of Minnesota, and looked for our support. They had received that, that uh, uh, funding of over $800,000, and just wanted to provide just a brief update uh, to this point, uh, in September they served 870, or excuse me, 700, eight, 87 households. Uh, in October they served 133 households. Uh, and through this past Friday they served a total of 233 households in Clay County, totaling $306,000. Uh, and so they're continuing to, to work to meet the, the deadline is 
uh, is also December for them. Uh, they've hired uh, some additional staff uh, and are partnering with presentation partners uh, to make sure that they're able to meet the, the requests that, that are before them by that deadline. But I think it's extremely important as uh, it's not just a, it's a community in, involvement of making sure from the county's perspective, uh, in this case this, in our local cities uh, and, and our different community partners who are working to, uh, to meet the needs of, of, our, of our citizens during this time. So I just wanted to make the board aware of that. Uh, that concludes uh, my report. Mr. Chair, can I? Steve, the, uh, that grant, wasn't that also to help those who might need rental assistance? That is, during, that's uh, correct, yes. You know, so rental assistance, uh, direct payments, uh, some uh, uh, heating, cooling, that type of thing. So um, I'm a little surprised at the number you said of 300 and some thousand. I, uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Campbell, it's not a matter of it's not a matter of the need. It's a matter of, of the being able to have these the staff to work process the application process. So okay. they they feel very comfortable um, and confident based on based on the uh, the setup that they have of where they are in in distributing the funds and feel uh, feel very comfortable that they'll be able to to uh, um, give out all the funds by by the, the due date. Just that one question on that um, DMV at the uh, Morgan Center Mall. I realize the parking lot goes all the way around. I mean, we weren't specified to say DMV parking is over here or anything. You can pretty much park where you want. I mean, there is really no, it's sort of centrally located. So no matter which door you go into, you almost have to walk the same distance, you know, wherever you park at. I was just wondering, we weren't assigned parking in a certain, uh, area I, I don't know how yeah. they work with the park in the yeah. good question mr. chair no there there are no restrictions on on uh, where where citizens uh, park and so they can uh, park wherever whatever best suits them no okay. okay any further questions for Steve or? Um, there? Commissioner gross I just wanted to uh, on the on the last uh, segment there with Kathy I just wanted to kind of give you an update of what the, the employees and how we handle those people that are COVID positive and or being isolated and quarantined. We HR does track that stuff and we do send out an email stating you know what they should be doing or how to fill out the time card correctly and then I go through the time cards every every uh, pay period and, and sign off on those. And so some of that information is getting out to our employees. So I know a lot of times Kathy and, um, and Jamie talk about the citizens and, and everything, but I think as far as the employees go, we're tracking it pretty darn good once they let us know that somebody has been either quarantined or um, isolated due to the COVID. And then they do get the emergency paid sick leave from the time they get tested to the time those test results come back. And if they do come back negative, they are told to, to contact, or I'm sorry, if they do come back positive and they are out for a certain amount of time, they are told to contact public health before they come back to work. So there is, there is I don't want you to think that uh, there's no information out there, especially for our employees, because we are providing that uh, as part of what, when I receive that form from them, that starts a whole litany of tracking process that we do for our employees. I'm They're glad to hear that and I guess I didn't mean to infer that we're not doing enough. What I'm trying to infer is we as citizens of Clay County have a responsibility. Yep. We can't wait for you to say hey now do this do this. Yep. We can't wait for the health department to say do this do this. We as citizens have a responsibility yep. and we have to take up that responsibility to get tested and do our uh, watch how we to our contact with the community you know that that's our responsibility we can't we can't mandate that I mean you just gotta as a citizen do that yep. and uh, no I appreciate what you're doing and uh, I know the health department's doing all that too but yeah. <coughs> excuse me but um, I, I'm putting my res I'm putting the responsibility on the citizens of Lake County we need to take up that or do our part Okay, we're done with that part.
Then we're going to go on to, Darren, you're going to talk to us about the Human Technical Assistance sure. Program. Um, as you uh, probably remember, probably back in the March time frame, um, AMC had a program which was called the Human Resources Technical Assistance Program. And they have received, they received a grant for this program to go on for three years uh, at no cost to the counties. Um, that grant is up this year. And so uh, the AMC has put out to all the counties if they wanted to participate in this program. Um, when I brought this to the board the first time, this would have been money that comes out of the, the county budget. Um, since that time, I have contacted AMC and also looked at some of the stuff that is coming out in this AMC um, Human Resources Technical Assistance Program. And a lot of it is uh, CARES and COVID related. And so um, what I'd like to do is rec or suggest and uh, ask for the money, the $4,900 per year, to come out of the CARES funding um, because it does deal a lot with the CARES and COVID. And what it is is it's kind of a subscription for the year. And anytime we have a question about something, we can uh, put our, our question into this uh, David Drown Associates. If you remember, they're the ones that did our wage study as well. And uh, within 24 hours, I normally have a very good answer back. Um, so the $4,900 uh, AMC believes that that could be CARES related. Uh, I did take this to the CARES committee and it was voted on to, um, to pay for this through the CARES Act funds. Um, as you see from the chart, we do have some CARES funding available. And um, just, just as a, an example, not only do they, if we suggest or put in questions and they respond, but they also put out information on a weekly basis, usually weekly, maybe every week and a half, uh, something will come out related to HR changes that are going on. And the one that just came out on Friday has to do with um, the CDC and pregnancies and increased risks and how they're looked at, uh, whether they're, they're um, increased risk or m might be at risk. And, and so those are the type of things that I would have never known had these, you know, things come out and changed. It's not something I track every day. I, I have enough to do just keeping my head above water right now. Um, so that does uh, provide a service to this. It's almost kind of like having a HR specialist on call. Um, we don't have to, I don't have to call the labor attorney to get answers to some of this stuff. I get a, a very quick turnaround. Um, another example of this was we recently had an employee that passed away, and uh, so I wrote in uh, a thing on, you know, how do we handle taxes and final paychecks and all of that other stuff, stuff that doesn't really happen too often and would have probably taken me a half a day to research, and I sent that in on Friday afternoon and Monday morning I had a, a very detailed response on what we do if they, we have the death of an employee and what do we do with the taxes? Do we take taxes out, para? They were able to call the IRS, they were able to call para and all of this. And so it's something that I could have done, but with all the other things that are going on right now, it's very difficult for me to take a half a day and research these types of questions. So I uh, wanted to bring this back to the board to see if that would be acceptable to use CARES money to pay for the 2021 um, subscription fee to the uh, HR technical assistance program. Mr. Chair, Go ahead. we did discuss this yesterday at our CARES meeting and everybody on the committee agreed that it would be an appropriate expense to fall into that category and I would move that we um, authorize that. Second. Then we're going to motion a second to uh, authorize the $4,900. Uh, <clears throat> any discussion on this? And my discussion would be Okay, so this is just a one-year thing then? Uh, um, I mean, this continues, and I think it's a good thing that we have this contact with these people, because that's like hiring an extra employee. I mean, having all that information available to you, just with a, a phone call or something like that. So, uh, but this is just a one-year thing, huh? Or? Correct. It's for 2021. 
Um, I don't foresee uh, COVID going away at the end of the year. Um, so this would be 2021, and then any following year. But do we have up. funds for 2021, or are we use this year's funds? Uh, we would use the CARES Act dollars for to pay the pay the have right now. Yes. So the the uh, forty nine hundred dollars would come out of the CARES money for this year, for this for this coming year for twelve month period of time. At that point in time, we could reevaluate the so necessity. We're paying a year ahead. I'll yeah. Year Correct. Ahead. Correct. Mm -hmm. And we we could reevaluate in a year to see if if it's still necessary to move forward. Well, if the CARES committee get uh, us all for this, I'm definitely for it too. Um, any further discussion? Roll call vote. Commissioner Whalen. Aye. Commissioner Campbell. Aye. Commissioner Mojo. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Haney. Aye. Commissioner Gross. Aye. Thank you very much. Okay, the next thing we're going to do uh, additional furniture purchase for the motor vehicle department. Mr. Larson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as I mentioned uh, this week, the DMV uh, is uh, transitioning over to the Morehead Center Mall location. Uh, there's just some additional furniture that, uh, that they will need in that location to, to make sure that uh, they have adequate spacing and, and uh, uh, dis I guess, coverage between two between the two staffing stations. And so the request before the board this morning uh, is to, to spend an additional $5,426.08 on the parts uh, to make sure that they're ready to, ready to go here uh, next week. And this, uh, this would be taken out of the COVID infrastructure mitigation category. Okay. I'll move to approve. Second. Okay, got a motion by Grant, second by Kevin to approve the $5,426.08 purchase of furniture. Any further discussion? Roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Whalen. Aye. Commissioner Campbell. Aye. Commissioner Mojo. Aye. Commissioner Haney. Aye. Commissioner Gross. Aye. Okay. Looks like we got everything covered uh, for today. We'll go into committee reports then. <coughs> Kevin, you want to start us off today? Sure. Uh, yesterday uh, morning we had our CARES committee meeting. Uh, we've we've acted on those items that were that we spent most of the time talking about. There, as, as Darren mentioned, there will be a few more things that will be coming forward. Smaller items next week or the week after that. Yesterday afternoon, um, we had a landfill construction meeting out at the landfill. Um, that is the uh, cell expansion went really well. The closure on the one part is now in process and looking really good. The uh, the uh, gas line, the loop on the gas line for uh, the current incinerator and the new incinerator is about complete and ready to go. Um, they were pouring the concrete pad uh, yesterday for the uh, new road that will go up to the existing landfill where they had to move the road and recreate it. Um, and they are working on the new um, area where the public will be able to go in and there'll be four bays that um, the citizens can use to dispose of um, materials including the ability to use the dump trailers so it's uh, I think it's going to be a, a, a long overdue but really good improvement to that landfill and, and it's there uh, the, the uh, contractors really really done a good job in keeping it up to date now. And I don't know if Mr. Mitt Whalen might have more to add to that, but that concludes my report. Okay. Jim, did you have something? Yes. Um, on Thursday last week, we had the 
joint power meeting. And uh, we discussed uh, uh, the main topic is uh, whether to hold the governmental retreat this year or not. And uh, if to hold it, uh, then what kind of topics we be looking at is uh, I would think that uh, in light of the new numbers that we're getting from the COVID-19, uh, we should rethink really think about uh, holding any kind of a public meeting like that at this point in time. That's just my opinion. And then uh, later on, that same day, we had the building committee, uh, Commissioner Gross and I, and the uh, uh, department heads and Steve were there for that. We discussed uh, the um, presentation from Clyde McCarthy architect Scott Petty uh, about the, um, the building over on 12th Avenue on 34th Street and uh, various details having to do with that. That's my report. Okay. Grant, do you have them? Uh, I just had uh, solid waste uh, yesterday and uh, Kevin already reported on that. It is uh, nice to see the work that's been done out there. Uh, I think the weather has pretty much cooperated. And uh, uh, yeah, it's considering where we were a couple months ago and where they're at now, it's pretty amazing. So, but it's it's all good. That's it for me. Okay. Jenny, you got something? Thank you, Mark. My meetings last Wednesday I had two meetings uh, <clears throat> with the Wild Rice Watershed Board. Uh, uh, one was their regular meeting, monthly meeting, uh, just routine stuff there. Uh, uh, and then in the afternoon we approved uh, the one watershed to one plan. Uh, and that's been moved on to Bowser for implement implementation. And we'll be waiting to hear on them and should be another meeting coming up probably in January sometime to make final approval of that. And as Jim had said that we did meet on the building committee on Thursday afternoon. And I guess <clears throat> of all the people that were there that are gonna be involved in this move, in this move, I really was impressed in everybody's, what they involved, what they brought into, what they need, uh, the, you know, how many spaces they're going to need, what they need for for storage and all that stuff, you know. And and I was glad to see Scott from Fly McCarthy there. He seems very acquainted with what the needs of the county are, you know. And at first, you know, I thought, well, can we figure this out ourselves, how to move into this building? It's one open space. But, boy, the more you got involved in this, you found out that we really do need someone to tell us, okay, here's, do this, do this, and do that, you know. And I, I'm glad we went forward with that uh, contract with Lyon McCarthy to help us out with that project because that's going to be one big undertaking. Uh, hopefully that works out good, you know, but uh, to get everybody situated in there is going to be uh, um, a, quite an effort. So, I mean, it, there's just a lot, everybody that was going to be moving over there was involved in the meeting. I was glad to see the people there and further in. Um, those are my three meetings. Uh, Steve, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, last Wednesday, I participated in the Corona uh, Cares Fund meeting, and that's been addressed. Uh, that morning, we also had uh, department head management. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, our, our new commissioners that will be coming forward in, in January. We had public health update. Uh, we talked open enrollment uh, in, in MCIT uh, schedule reviews. Uh, if I could just give uh, uh, some credit to the HR department uh, again that, that uh, Darren and Anna just uh, did a tremendous job for Anna this being her first time 
Uh, I think we, she had to process a, of our 600 or 400 plus uh, benefited employees. I think that uh, she had about 170 of them to do in the last three days. And so uh, she did just a, a tremendous job of working through that. Uh, on the fifth, uh, we did have the joint uh, powers committee uh, uh, care that Commissioner uh, Haney's discussed. Uh, I think we are, we are uh, have, looking to make that move to make that a virtual meeting. We will not be meeting uh, in person. Uh, for for that uh, January 29th meeting. Uh, we had some good discussions about bonding. Uh, uh, the city of Moorhead uh, talked about our transfer station, uh, also the underpass, uh, the flood dollars, uh, and they reported that, uh, you know, Clay County from a, from a funding standpoint received roughly 5% uh, of the total bonding dollars uh, a lot of this year. So uh, quite, a, quite a heavy lift from, from our representatives here uh, and legislators, so that was great news. Uh, and also just wanted to, to point out, uh, uh, Mayor Olson I wanted to extend his appreciation to, to this uh, board for extending the business relief grants. Uh, he said that was a great benefit to his communities. Uh, and also Superintendent uh, Brandon Lunick also wanted to, uh, to uh, point out the, the great work that Kathy and her staff have been. Uh, Kathy mentioned earlier the weekly superintendent updates and, uh, and uh, Brandon just wanted to recognize uh, the good work uh, that they do. Uh, on the, the 5th, I met with Kathy on a series of uh, issues with public health. Uh, that afternoon, again, we met with, uh, we met with Klein McCarthy. That's been covered uh, by Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Gross. Uh, we're hoping to uh, uh, get a potential layout of that building by tomorrow. Uh, and then our building committee will meet again on Friday. Um, Friday, I worked on some organization for the intergovernment retreat, the speakers. Uh, teams platform things like that uh, on the Monday uh, we had a cares committee that's been addressed uh, and also uh, met uh, participated in, in the meeting uh, that the Commissioner Campbell and Wayland uh, out at the landfill and uh, just the last thing uh, the two-year tax abatement just want to, to uh, uh, put this out there that uh, while we just generally send letters historically to to our cities and our school districts that townships are uh, are certainly able to participate in the two-year tax abatement we've had some interest from a number of our counties or a number of our townships uh, and so we may see that uh, in our in our january uh, in january when we go through that that process finalize that process and then again just a reminder our dmv is closing today at 1:30, uh, and we'll be reopening uh, reopening uh, on monday in the more center mall location and that concludes my report Okay. Anything from anybody else? Brian, you got something to let us know? Okay. Darren, you're okay? <clears throat> one other thing, I'd like to welcome David Ebenberg, who's, who's going to take over for District 1 for a grant. Uh, District 5. Or 5, excuse me. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome to the group here. Thank you. Thank you for showing up here. Okay. With that, we're adjourned. <laughs>